Doctor, doctor, please. He's the one you call Doctor Feelgood. They call me Doctor Love. Gotta see my rock and roll doctor. Somebody get me a doctor. I'm your witch doctor, cause I'm the doctor. Doctor me, baby, down in my soul. There's a lot of f***ing metal songs about doctors. But all those that I just referenced are sort of cartoonish and cheeky because they're meant to be. And that's all good because at the end of the day, heavy metal is supposed to be fun. But what I'm here to talk about goes beyond the cheesy, sexed up role playing of heavy metal and beyond the hack and slash gore fiends of death metal. I'm talking about the most brutal side of medicine surgery. Now, I racked my brain and Google search bar to find metal songs about surgery from the 1970s, but for the life of me, I just couldn't find anything. And maybe you guys can help me with that in the comment section. But as far as I know, the first real heavy metal song about surgery in particular was Twisted Sisters Under the Blade. Uh, the song was written about my guitar player, Eddie Ojeda. He was having polyps removed from his throat, and he was very fearful of this operation. And I said, Eddie, while you're in the hospital, I'm going to write a song for you. The, I said it was about the fear of operations. I think people imagine being helpless on a table, a bright light in their face, the blade coming down on them, and having no, totally afraid that they may wake up, who knows, dead, handicapped. It's a certain fear of hospitals. That's what, that's in my imagination what I see the hospitals like. Considering the amount of surgical themes and references that Extreme Metal would go on to implement, it really solidified my opinion that Twisted Sister really didn't get the credit that they deserved as heavy metal trailblazers. Maybe that's why the PMRC and Al Gore were so baffled by Under the Blade during the so-called porn rock hearings, because songs about surgery were just unheard of back then. And I imagine if that Senate hearing was held just one year later, Dee Snider wouldn't have been the only metal musician up on that stand. Jeff Hanneman could have been up there too, because imagine the PMRC's reaction to Angel of Death. Holy shit, it would have topped the Filthy 15, and rightfully so, because it's still the absolute benchmark of extreme metal. The surgical references Hanneman painted of Dr. Mengele and his cruel experiments on death camp prisoners are still horrifying. Sadistic surgeon of demise, sadist of the noblest blood, surgery with no anesthesia, feel the knife pierce you intensely. It was so extreme that the record label didn't want to release the song, but Slayer and Rick Rubin would not relent, and it came out. I feel you should be able to write about whatever you want, Jeff Hanneman told The Guardian in 1987. Angel of Death is like a history lesson. I'd read a lot about the Third Reich and was absolutely fascinated by the extremity of it all. The way Hitler had been able to hypnotize a nation and do whatever he wanted. A situation where Mengele could evolve from being a doctor to being a butcher. Slayer's brutality often had real ties to history, but a pure fascination with surgical practice and complex medical language? Not so much. Enter Carcass, who became the ultimate gore band, thanks, in part, to Jeff Walker's sister. How did you get him to writing these technical board lyrics? Uh, I think it was like, I think Ken was the first person to write lyrics to his band. Yeah. He was, and, uh, and then, uh, I mean, Bill started writing lyrics and I started writing. Yeah. And I just took it one step further, I think, by getting his sister's nursing dictionary. And uh, it was just basically, what we were trying to do was just take it, take, you know, so-called death metal a bit further, make it a bit more realistic, a bit more, uh, instead of saying gore and guts all the time, you know, actually, yeah. You know, describing what the hell we're on about and uh, avoiding slang or colloquial terms, you know, proper English. That's what it's always been about. And now it's getting even more twisted, whereas we're making, well, not making words up, but we're crossing words. And it's just like, as when, when you compose notes together or, you know, riffs to make, you know, a song, it's the same with words to make lyrics. It's, it's more flowing, it's more poetic. Half the time, it doesn't make sense, the lyrics. It's just pure stupidity, you know. Reek of Putrefaction is considered the first gore grind album, featuring bizarre and contradictory terms from the medical lexicon like microwaved uterogestation and oxidized razor masticator. And the next year, Symphonies of Sickness took the amount of syllables to the next level with, with cadaveric incubator of endoparasites, I think. With cadaveric incubator, with, with cadaveric with cadaveric incubator of endoparasites. These albums were so influential that an entire new category came in heavy metal, 
carcass clones. Somehow, and to our amazement, it caused an outpouring of similar sounding demo bands, Earache Records says. They popped up everywhere like a rash. Normally bands keep an eye on their progress via monitoring record sales, but Carcass had no sales numbers to speak of, so the band could only judge their success by the number of their clones. The first Carcass clone was arguably Zyzma, followed by bands like General Surgery, Exhumed, and Dead Infection. General Surgery guitarist Jacques Carlson recalls, Matty called me one night and he was really worked up about this band he wanted to get going that were supposed to sound more like Carcass than Carcass themselves. But Carcass's influence didn't come without conflict. In March 1991, British police raided the Earache Records office. They obtained a warrant to search for obscene articles and associated documentation kept for gain, seizing copies of Reek of Putrefaction and Symphonies of Sickness, along with cadavers, hallucinating anxiety, Filthy Christians, Mean, and the debut from Fudge Tunnel. It was the cover art that authorities took exception to, as Reek of Putrefaction featured a collage of decomposing corpses and diseased and dismembered body parts, all cut and pasted from pathology textbooks. Symphonies of Sickness featured a similar montage, adding images of meat and cutlery for good measure. The police duly raided our Nottingham offices at 10 a.m. one morning, I was served with an arrest warrant under the Obscene Publications Act. It was heavy stuff. I encouraged our bands to be repulsive with their artwork, but I had no idea it was actually borderline illegal to do. After about six months of waiting to be prosecuted, the charges were dropped, Digby Pearson said. One of the greatest album covers of all time is the one for Autopsies Severed Survival. The alternate one. It was dreamt up by Kev Walker, who would go on to work for Marvel and DC Comics. Kev Walker had an idea for an autopsy painting. We didn't give him a lot of detail like we did for the original cover. Once we saw it, we liked it. But we never talked with them, guitarist Eric Cutler recalls. And Chris Reifert adds, Peaceville was thinking about making an alternate to get more distribution, and we just thought it was cool to have more art. We liked the first cover, but it was two for the price of one. I think it's the only album cover Kev's ever done. Now he's doing Spider-Man and James Bond comics. And back to the so-called Carcass clones, countless underground bands continued to create in the name of their gore grind heroes. Spain's hemorrhage decided to wear doctor scrubs after guitarist Luisma discovered reek of putrefaction in a Madrid record shop, deciding to forge a band in the early earache image. When I played Reek, I was totally blown apart, he recounts. I had never listened to anything like that. In the beginning, we got impressed with Carcass lyrics. In the early 90s, all the death grind bands were writing lyrics about gore, you know, zombies. But Carcass lyrics were more extreme and sicker because they were about pathology. As for Exhumed, Matt Harvey says, I wanted to recapture the fun I used to have watching gory movies and drinking Meisterbrow with my buddies in the mid 90s. I think that people really key in on a band sounding like Carcass for some reason. I've never seen as many disparaging clone comments and reviews as I've seen for Carcass-influenced bands. And the county medical examiners took their dedication to the next level, reportedly working in the medical field for real. Dr. Morgan Fairbanks explains, Jack Putnam is a hospital pathologist. Guy Radcliffe is in hospital administration, but he used to be a medical examiner. And I'm working through my forensic pathology apprenticeship so I'm basically a medical examiner now. I think part of me wants to pound the last nail into the carcass clone coffin to be that instrument, but a bigger part of me wants to make symphonies over and over again. It's like a love letter. They say most baby animals having outlived its mother will remain with her corpse and futilely suckle until it starves. That's my band. And maybe part of the carcass clone thing was to keep the surgery party going after carcass broke up in 1996 releasing the aptly titled Swan Song that same year. But Jeff Walker didn't seem too impressed by the clones. When asked about clone bands and what he saw for the future of his genre, Walker replied, none. Carcass disintegrated after Swan Song, basically declaring that the gore grind autopsy had been completed and its body had been thrown to the crematory. But medicine and surgery didn't just influence metal, it went the other way too. German surgeon Dr. Claudius Conrad, who also trained as a concert pianist and holds a PhD in music philosophy, conducted a scholarly research 
on the effect of music in the operating room. In one study, he played death metal through one channel and German folk music through the other. Here's Dr. Conrad speaking to NPR about his research. What are we listening to there? We are listening to experimental music and one of our interests was to study the effects of auditory stress on surgical performance and especially on individual components of performance. Is it speed or is it accuracy influenced by auditory stress? And um, the results were surprising. <laughs> that uh, people who had to listen to this dichaotic music still completed the task successfully, but it took them more time. Yes, and, and those were very senior experts of surgeons. So now we uh, also looked at people who are early in their career, they're novices of surgery. How does stress uh, influence their performance, which is a very realistic situation. A young surgeon operates in the operating room and the floor calls in or there's a conversation in the background, there's noise induced by machines we use in the operating room. And interestingly, with them, the influence by this dichaotic music varied a great deal, and um, this is data that will uh, come out soon. You can see this doctor performing surgery while blasting the death metal band Pound, of which Matt Harvey is a member. When Yob's Mike Sheet almost died from diverticulitis, his surgeon played Yob's music in the operating room because he thought it helped Sheet hang in there during the procedure. And there's plenty of research that points to all genres of metal having a positive effect on the mental health of fans. And with modern metal classics like Cattle Decap's Forced Gender Reassignment and The Return of Carcass with Surgical Steel, it's obvious that metal fans still appreciate a cut from the surgical scalpel. When, for want of a better word, the masters of the craft come back, people are hungry for it. Because there's been lots of bands that have ripped off Carcass, but arguably, have they been better than what we did? I don't know. So the next time some simp starts talking about how metal is lowbrow or trash or stupid, do me a favor and call him a crepitating bowel erosion, and then leave him to rupture in their own virulency.